Hi, welcome to our channel of IGNO Audiobooks, Indira Gandhi National Open University, School of Continuing Education, SOCE, Master's Degree Programs, Master of Science, Food Nutrition, MSCDFSM, Revised, MFN 005 Clinical Therapeutic Nutrition, Second Year, Unit 3 Nutritional Management of Infections and Fevers, 3.1 Introduction, in this unit, we shall deal with defense mechanisms and the role of nutrition in managing fevers and infections caused due to impairment in the immune system. Go through these two examples given below to have a brief idea of the kind of issues with which we shall deal in this unit. Case Aishalini is a easy-going college student, 19 years of age. Extremely fond of Snacking and trying out all varieties of food ranging from the dhabas to the branded ones. This summer she took ill. She had fever which she never monitored to begin with, but it kept on rising day by day. She was anorexic, felt bloated, complained of abdominal cramps and episodes of diarrhea. She lost considerable weight. What do you think is the problem with Shalini? Case to Ram Singh is a coolie. He stays in the adjoining hutments of the railway, station which has bad drainage, poor lighting and ventilation. In the recent past, he has been suffering frequently from upper respiratory infection, cold, cough and mild fever. This has been continuing for the past one year. Now he has started feeling weak and his cough has worsened with thick sputum and sometimes blood in sputum. What do you think Ram Singh is suffering from? What are the factors conditions which have led to this state for Shalini and Ram Singh? What is the basic difference between the two cases presented? How does the management of the two cases differ? These are some of the questions which will be answered in this unit. Infection, as you are already aware of, brings about many undesirable physiological changes which must be taken care of by proper nutrition care. How are these infections fevers classified? What metabolic changes occur during such conditions? These are the issues which we will review in this unit. Finally, we will focus on the etiology, clinical manifestations and dietary management of different types of infections including typhoid and HIV AIDS. Objectives After studying this unit you will be able to discuss the various defense mechanisms in the body which protect us from infections, explain the relationship between nutrition and infection, differentiate between acute and chronic infections, identify the symptoms associated with some common acute and chronic infections and their physiological significance, and describe the dietary management of acute and chronic infections, 3 point to defense mechanism in the body. You would recall reading about defense mechanisms in the course of applied physiology MFN 001 in Unit 3. What is meant by defense mechanism? What is its role? How does it function? Let us review once again, defense mechanisms relate to the body's ways to protect itself from any infection or a disease. These mechanisms can be a. Non-specific, these relate to the physical barriers like skin and mucus, membrane. They form the first line of defense against entry of microorganisms or foreign substances in your body. Various body secretions, intestinal flora, iron, binding proteins, certain nutrients like vitamin A, vitamin C, protein and zinc, hormonal influences and leukocytes, WBC, act against infections. B. Specific, these relate to specialized cells located throughout the body which respond to invasion of foreign materials microorganisms such as bacteria, virus, fungi or unwanted substances produced or entering the body. Some specific cells are fixed in tissues such as thymus, lymph nodes, bone marrow, spleen, lymphoid tissue of the respiratory, gastrointestinal and genitourinary tract, cupfer, 
cells of the liver and pays patches of the small intestine c others these include the mobile cells such as leukocytes and lymphocytes they are released in the blood and are carried to the site where they are needed when the microorganisms invade the tissue the specific immune defense mechanisms response can be broadly classified into two types a cell mediated immune response this is achieved through large number of activated lymphocytes that are specially designed to destroy foreign agents example the t lymphocytes produced by the thymus b humoral immune response the body develops circulating antibodies which are globulin molecules that are capable of attacking the invading agents b lymphocytes are produced by lymphoid tissue we suggest you look up unit 3 in the applied physiology course to understand these immune responses before you read further about the relationship between nutrition and infection 3.3 nutrition and infection the interaction between nutrition and infection is synergistic that is nutritional deficiency lowers resistance to infection and infection aggravates existing malnutrition individuals who are chronically undernourished not only succumb to infection more readily but take a longer period to recover than do the well nourished there are series of studies to show the specific roles of nutrients like vitamin a vitamin c vitamin e omega 3 fatty acids trace minerals like iron zinc which have a role either in terms of maturation number and or activity of t cells and b cells these have an influence on the cellular and humoral immunity if you wish to go into the details of specific role of individual nutrients in the immune process you could refer to some additional references listed at the end of this course malnutrition impaired immunity and infection can form a triad or vicious cycle as illustrated in figure 3.1 which works synergistically and thus worsens the condition of an individual for example a patient suffering from typhoid if not provided with good nutritional support would deteriorate his nutritional status and develop nutrient deficiencies which would be detrimental to the immune system an impaired immune system would increase the susceptibility to infections so the synergism of malnutrition and infection must be clear next let us see what metabolic changes occur during infection which impact on our nutritional needs 3.4 metabolic changes during infection with the rise in body temperature above normal 98.4 degrees fahrenheit or 37 degrees celsius due to infection several metabolic changes occur in the body that increase nutritional needs some important changes are discussed below one the basal metabolic rate bmr increases in severe infection with fever there is a 7% increase in bmr with every 1 degree fahrenheit increase in body temperature or 13% increase in bmr with every 1 degree celsius rise in body temperature the energy needs are estimated to be 20% above bmr for mild infections and 70% above bmr for severe infections injury factors can also be taken into consideration to work out the exact calorie expenditure to nutrient losses may be increased due to increased perspiration vomiting and diarrhea minerals like sodium potassium zinc magnesium and phosphorus are lost by the body 3 infection and fever sets in an environment of catabolism breakdown in the body infection can be related to a state of physiological stress the body responds to this stress by altering the levels of several hormones to meet the increased requirements acute phase response increased levels of glucocorticoids growth hormone catecholamines glucagon work synergistically to increase glycogenolysis breakdown of glycogen and gluconeogenesis formation of glucose from non carbohydrate sources in addition increased insulin levels 
and insulin resistance at the cellular level decreases the ability of the body to utilize carbohydrates as substrate for energy. Thus, body favors protein breakdown, catabolism, followed by fat breakdown, lipolysis, as the major substrate for meeting the energy requirements. Branched chain amino acids, eucin, isoleucin and valine, are used as major substrate for energy by the liver through the process of transamination, transfer of amine group, deamination, removal of NH3 from amino acid, followed by gluconeogenesis. The muscle breakdown favors nitrogen excretion and sets in a state of negative nitrogen balance excretion intake. The rate of protein breakdown, catabolism, increases depending upon the severity of the infection and the duration of fever. There are increased losses in long continuous fevers than in short duration fevers. Protein breakdown is especially marked in fevers such as typhoid, malaria, poliomyelitis and tuberculosis. This leads to increased nitrogen wastes and places. An additional burden on the kidneys for infection and fever is invariably accompanied by anorexia, lack of appetite, which limits the food intake causing decreased energy intake which is not sufficient to meet the increased energy requirements. Thus leading to weight loss which, particularly marked in severe infections, 5. The absorption of nutrients also decreases if there are intestinal infections, 6. Excessive sweat and urination causes further loss of body fluids and electrolytes. This can be an outcome of severe infection with high fever. The sweating occurs in response to high fever while the volume of urine is increased for elimination of nitrogen wastes produced due to catabolic activities. 7. Glycogen and adipose tissue stores decrease significantly due to increased energy expenditure. The above changes accompanied by loss of appetite, increase in energy needs, losses, of protein due to catabolic activities, loss of fluid or electrolytes due to perspiration, vomiting and diarrhea or poor absorption of some nutrients. Leads to loss of weight, poor eating precipitates, loss of weight particularly if the infection is prolonged. Thus, infection may have a significant effect on nutritional status. The extent would depend on the following factors, a nature of infection, b. severity of the infection, c. duration of the infection, d. presence or absence of fever, and e. nutritional state of the individual before the infection sets in. Next, let us review how fevers are classified. 3.5 Classification and Etiology of Fever Infection Infection and fevers can be classified into two broad categories. a. Acute infections fever. Acute fevers are of short duration with acute symptoms. The body temperature may rise to above 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Examples of such infections are chickenpox, tonsillitis, influenza, pneumonia, typhoid and malaria. B. Chronic infections fever. These are generally of longer and sustained duration. The patients have a past history of repeated episodes or continued spells of infection. Such infection may be characterized with a low-grade fever, which continues for even several months as in the case of tuberculosis. Thus chronic fever is the one which has a slow, gradual onset and may be low-grade in nature. Examples of chronic fever infections include tuberculosis, HIV infection and AIDS, fevers can also be intermittent or cyclic in pattern and they are associated with infections like malaria, infection and fevers are coexistent. Fever is an outcome of the infection, you must have had fever sometime in your life. Do you remember? What caused it? In other words, what was the etiology of the fever? A number of internal endogenous and external exogenous factors play a role. Let us see what they are. Etiology, fevers can be caused due to 1. 
internal endogenous factors this could be caused within the body examples are antigen antibody reactions malignant cancer graft rejections too external exogenous factors these are caused by bacteria fungi virus etc which invades the body the cause is from a source outside the body fevers caused by these external factors can be seen in the flow chart given in figure 3.2 bacteria fungus virus infection due to bacteria fungi or any antigenic input activation of phagocytes in the bone marrow release of pyrogen fever inducing hormone synthesis of prostaglandins hormone like substance thermoregulatory center in the anterior hypothalamus increase in temperature figure 3.2 development of fever exogenous factor so far in this section we have discussed about the basic concepts and interrelationship between fever infection and their association with nutrition in the subsequent sections we shall be discussing about some common infections such as typhoid tuberculosis and hiv aids to help you in gaining an in-depth understanding regarding the care of patients with acute or chronic infections and fever however let us first perform the check your progress exercise before proceeding further 3.6 typhoid typhoid is often called enteric fever because the infection or bacteria is found in the intestines and attaches itself to the epithelium of the intestinal wall where it multiplies or finally reaches the blood causing damage and increase in the body temperature typhoid is an enteric fever which relates to acute infection of short duration it is caused by bacteria called salmonella typhosa about which you may recall studying in the food microbiology and safety course mfn 003 in unit 5 subsection 5.4.1 the mode of spread of this infection is through the fecal oral route the source of infection is the drinking water milk and food contaminated by intestinal contents through feces and urine of the patients or carriers or by flies which transmit the disease it may affect all age groups but is commonly observed in children the incidence and magnitude of typhoid fever has greatly reduced in the present context due to improved sanitation and vaccines and effective drugs available it is important for you to understand that this fever has a number of adverse effects on the body as it is extremely catabolic in nature thus in no time it causes weakness and compromised state of nutrition causing tremendous weight loss some observations seen in this fever are 1 massive loss of lean body mass or muscle due to tissue breakdown 250 to 500 g muscle tissue is lost day leading to excessive nitrogen losses too body stores of glycogen are quickly depleted because of increased energy requirements 3 the gastrointestinal tract is highly inflamed and irritable as the seat of typhoid infection is the pious patches of the intestine the bacteria attaches to the epithelium of the intestinal wall penetrates and multiplies in the mesenteric lymph nodes eventually reaching the blood stream which in turn leads to secondary infection of the intestines 4 excessive diarrhea vomiting and perspiration can cause a lot of fluid and electrolyte losses 5 inflammation of gi tract can lead to intestinal ulceration and bleeding clinical symptoms of typhoid are one graded fever which follows an upward ladder pattern two abdominal pain cramps and diarrhea 3 anorexia and vomiting 4 internal hemorrhage and malaria gastrointestinal bleeding and black tarry stools management of the typhoid patient includes 1 bed rest 2 antibiotic therapy 3 modification of diet we should leave the antibiotic drug therapy to a physician but we can learn more about the dietary management in the following text dietary management the golden rule in the dietary management of any fever is feed the fever considering that enteric typhoid fever is accompanied by anorexia vomiting 
and high grade temperature, the diet has to be modified as per the patient's tolerance, the patient needs to be encouraged to eat. Feeding several times a day improves. Tolerance The texture of foods given would depend on the severity of infection, bland, low fiber and soft foods are beneficial. The dietary principles underlying the enteric diet include high calorie, high protein, high carbohydrate, moderate fat, high fluid, low fiber and soft diet. Now let us go further in details on the specifications of each nutrient and the basis for working the requirement of the same for the given condition. Energy Fever is characterized by elevation of BMR, thus caloric requirements are increased. The increase in caloric needs is dependent on severity of infection and degree of rise of temperature. During fevers there is a decrease in appetite. As well as a decreased tolerance due to enteric infection, thus a desired increase in calories is 10 to 20% above the normal recommended requirements. The actual intake can be adjusted and given as per patient's tolerance, protein, the requirement of protein is increased in typhoid as there is a massive tissue loss. Thus, the protein intake should be increased above the normal of 1 gkg day to 1.5-2g of protein kg day. A high protein diet should be supported with a high carbohydrate intake to favor efficient protein utilization for anabolic or tissue building purposes. Foods providing appreciable and good quality protein, high biological value, should be incorporated in liberal amounts. Use of protein supplements is recommended to add on to the nutrient density without increasing the bulk of the diet, carbohydrates, carbohydrate intake should be liberal. This can be attributed to 1. Repletion of glycogen stores 2. Protein sparing action Nearly 60% of total calories should be provided from carbohydrates. Well-cooked, easily digestible carbohydrates like simple starches, glucose, honey, jam should be included as they require much less digestion and are well assimilated. Glucose can be supplemented in a variety of beverages like desserts as it is less sweet than sucrose and adds on to the total calorie intake, dietary fiber, typhoid patient has an inflamed intestinal mucosa, which can be easily perforated and ulcerated leading to internal hemorrhage. Thus foods high in fiber, such as certain green leafy vegetables, whole pulses or cereals, Thick skins or fruits or vegetables must be avoided. These are rich in insoluble fibers. Soluble fibers can be given fats. Use of fats should be in moderation. This is because the typhoid patient has a compromised ability to digest and assimilate due to pious patches, elongated, thickening of the intestinal epithelium, which result in repeated episodes of diarrhea, fats help in increasing the energy density of the food without increasing the bulk of the diet, but the aspect which needs to be emphasized is the type of fat. Use of dairy, fats like butter, cream, fats in milk products, egg yolk etc. help in easy digestion as they contain medium-chain triglycerides. Excessive use of fat in cooking Eating fried foods can aggravate nausea, impair digestion and lead to severe diarrhea. These should be avoided minerals, loss of electrolytes and water is observed due to diarrhea. Thus liberalizing on sodium intake through salty soups, beverages are desired. Potassium intake can be increased by emphasis in cooked fruits, low-fiber vegetables, washed and dehusked pulses. Food preparations in forms like juices, stews, soups and dull water are beneficial. The other minerals, which are of importance, include iron particularly if blood is lost. Due to hemorrhage in the intestines. Losses of zinc and chromium have also been observed. Vitamins, vitamins which need to be emphasized include B-complex, considering the 
increase in the energy requirement and a decreased ability of the intestine to assimilate and synthesize some of the B-complex vitamin due to compromised digestive processes and altered microbial flora. As a result, antibiotics are prescribed. In addition, vitamins A and C are also needed to boost immunity, favor wound healing and maintenance of the integrity of epithelial membrane, gut mucosa. Vitamin supplementation may be given in the early stages of the infection when the patient is anorexic and has low food tolerance, fluid, Liberal fluid intake is desired to compensate for the fluid losses from the body. A daily fluid intake of 2.5 to 3.5 liters may be recommended. Fluid intake can be accomplished through a variety of beverages, soups, juices, broths, dull besides plain water. Adequate fluid intake helps in eliminating wastes and maintaining water balance in the body. So remember the foods to be included are juices, soups, dull water, broths, refined cereals and their products, e.g. maida, rava, bread, rice, noodles, washed, dulls, pureed vegetables, stewed fruits. These foods contain low insoluble fiber eggs, cottage cheese, tender steamed or baked chicken fish. These contain high biological value proteins, fruit juices, gelatin, honey, sugar and milk products. Calorie and protein rich desserts could be prepared. Foods to be restricted include excessive milk and milk products and dairy fats such as cream and butter. Foods to be avoided are high fiber foods like whole grain cereals and their products e.g. whole wheat, flour, cracked wheat, whole pulses, raw vegetables and fruits, fried fatty foods, chemical irritants like spices, pickles, papad, ketchups etc. Next, we shall review the chronic fevers and see how dietary management of these differ from the acute fevers, 3.7 chronic fever infection. As mentioned earlier, Chronic fever and infection are always supported with a long-standing history of symptoms or repeated episodes of infection. One of the commonly observed chronic infections is tuberculosis. Let us understand the treatment and management of this chronic infection. 3.7.1 Tuberculosis Tuberculosis is a chronic infectious disease which is caused by a bacterium, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. It affects the lungs most commonly but can get localized in other organs also like lymph nodes, kidney, bone etc. The most commonly observed form of tuberculosis in India is pulmonary tuberculosis. The prevalence of tuberculosis earlier was restricted to lower socioeconomic strata. Being attributed to poor hygiene, sanitation and poor quality of food intake. The present Scenario reveals an increasing incidence of tuberculosis in people from higher socioeconomic strata as well. A strong genetic history gets highlighted in most of the cases. This disease presents itself in an acute and a chronic phase. In the acute stage, the disease is quite similar to that of acute fever and the chronic phase to that of chronic fever. The chronic phase is accompanied by low-grade fever and therefore increase in metabolic rate is not so marked. The long duration of illness in turn leads to wasting of body tissues. The symptoms, treatment and dietary management are enumerated next. A. Salient features of pulmonary tuberculosis The salient features tuberculosis include wasting of tissues, exhaustion, cough, expectoration and fever, the acute phase, resembles pneumonia with high fever. The chronic phase presents itself with low-grade fever accompanied with exhaustion, cough, expectoration and loss of weight. The progression of the disease may be slow with gradual worsening of the cough. This can lead to erosion of the blood vessel of lungs. The tubercle bacteria may thus subsequently get access to other body organs, thereby establishing numerous Secondary foci of infection B. Treatment 
the disease can be very effectively treated with the help of antibiotic therapy. Rest and Nourishing Food The key to the treatment is early detection of the disease. The antibiotic therapy given should be continued for the stipulated period of time, six months to one year, in spite of the waning of the symptoms. A clinically recovered, Tuberculosis case can still be a carrier and thus a relapse of the disease is likely if the antibiotic therapy is not followed the right way. Let us now proceed over to the nutritional care of patients suffering from tuberculosis. See Dietary Management It must be evident to you that majority of the tuberculosis patients are emancipated and malnourished. Proper Dietary Management During and after the infection is essential to ensure complete treatment. Proper rehabilitation and prevention of relapse. Let us review the energy and nutrient requirements of the patient. Energy, the criteria to establish the energy intake is the body weight status coupled with the rise in body temperature. Considering that the BMR is not highly elevated in the chronic stage of the disease, the energy intake may be increased by 300 to 500 cuckle day above the normal recommended intake protein. A chronic infection is marked by a prolonged duration of fever. This leads to wasting of muscles, increased nitrogenous loss and a subsequent decrease in serum albumin levels. Thus, the chronic stage of the disease needs to be supported with a High protein intake. A level of 1.2 to 1.5 g protein kg body weight day should be given. Emphasis should be on energy and protein dense foods coupled with high biological value of protein rich sources to favor its effective utilization. If the disease is observed in the low socioeconomic strata, selection of cheaper options of protein dense foods like pulses. Soya, nuts in combination with coarse cereals for mutual, supplementation may be opted for carbohydrates, adequacy of carbohydrate will also favor the optimal utilization of proteins. To favor the process of anabolism, a total calories to nitrogen ratio of 150, 1 should be achieved in a high calorie high protein diet. Carbohydrate being the most. Preferred substrate of energy by the body has a protein-sparing effect, fats, fats add to the calorie density of the diet. Digestibility of fats, medium chain, triglycerides and emulsified fats should be preferred and fat-based preparations should be considered. Vitamins, the vitamins of significance for a tuberculosis patient include A. Vitamin A the preformed vitamin A or the retinol form of vitamin A needs to be emphasized in the diet of TB patient as the metabolism of vitamin A is adversely affected. Carotene appears to be poorly converted to vitamin A. Considering that the retinol form is restricted to milk, milk products, dietary fats and animal foods, vitamin A supplement may be recommended. B. Vitamin B complex, the requirement of the B complex vitamin increases with an increase in the energy requirement of the tuberculosis patient. The salient, once out of the B complex group are pyridoxine, folic acid and vitamin B12 neuritis, inflammation of peripheral nerves, can be prevented by treatment with 50 to 100 mg per day dose of pyridoxine. Folic acid and vitamin B12 is also supplemented. C. Vitamin C. Vitamin C helps in collagen synthesis and helps healing of the tubercle lesions. Rich vitamin C food sources like amla, guava, drumsticks, cabbage, capsicum and citrus juice should be included liberally in a tuberculosis patient's diet minerals. The minerals to be emphasized in the diet of a tuberculosis patient include 1. Calcium. Calcium intake needs to be increased since it is essential for healing the tuberculosis lesions. Intake of half a liter to one liter of milk is recommended in different forms which can be well tolerated by the patient. Calcium. Supplementation. 
500 mg per day with active form of vitamin D may also be prescribed to iron. The need of iron may be a concern in case of blood loss associated with expectoration or hemorrhage. The patient's hemoglobin levels should be monitored. The diet should be tailored as per the needs. Supplementation with iron is recommended in case blood hemoglobin levels are low. 3. The other minerals of significance are zinc and chromium. These minerals help. In boosting the immune system, losses of these are seen in the patients having tuberculosis. Other considerations, I, the diet should have good amount of fluid and electrolytes, especially potassium. 2. Fiber need not be restricted, but the food options should be easy to digest and well tolerated. 3. Frequent nutrient dense feeds are recommended. Force feeding is not desired. 4. A normal dietary pattern needs to be followed with a wise, balanced and nutritious selection of foods. Let us conclude the discussion by highlighting the foods to be included or restricted in the diet of a tuberculosis patient. Foods to be included, cereals, ragi, jowar, bazra, dot, pulses, black channa, chavli, moth, rajma, dot, nuts and all seeds, green leafy vegetables like methi, Cholai, mint, spinach, cabbage, drumstick, leaves, colocasia and cauliflower greens, citrus fruits, guava, amla, capsicum, dot, milk and milk products, jaggery, sugar, foods to be restricted, excess fat, fried preparations, organ meats, liver, kidney, brain, red meat and refined sugars. You shall learn more about the principles of dietary management and planning of diets, for acute and chronic infections in the clinical and therapeutic nutrition practical manual mfnl 005 3.7.2 hiv human immunodeficiency virus infection and aids acquired immune deficiency syndrome hiv aids is another example of chronic infections its existence was discovered recently in 1981 the spread of HIV infection is widespread and can progress to AIDS. It has been shown to be caused by a retrovirus since it is one of the most dreaded infections and is growing at a rapid rate. Let us gain some more knowledge about it. Manifestations of HIV infection Four stages of HIV disease have been recognized. These are Acute HIV Infection Asymptomatic HIV infection, symptomatic HIV infection, AIDS. A brief review on these stages follows. Acute HIV infection. This period is 4 to 7 weeks after the primary infection. During this period, there is a rapid viral replication and the infected person develops an acute syndrome. Characterized by fever, malaise, pharyngitis, headache, lymphadenopathy syndrome, swollen, firm and sometimes tender lymph nodes, influenza or cancer of lymph nodes, myalgia, muscle pain weakness, dot, asymptomatic HIV, in asymptomatic HIV, very few symptoms may appear which are noticeable. This stage could even last for 10 years. Subclinical symptoms have been reported such as Decrease in lean body mass without apparent change in weight. There is an increased susceptibility to food and waterborne pathogens, symptomatic HIV. In this, the AIDS defining symptoms appear. A decline in nutritional status and body composition may occur. Fevers, sweating, skin problems, and fatigue may be seen. AIDS. The term AIDS encompasses life-threatening clinical conditions linked to HIV-induced immune suppression. A small portion of persons infected with HIV may develop AIDS within months following primary infection. AIDS is the terminal stage of HIV. Infections with bacteria, virus, fungi and protozoa are common. They are often the cause of diarrhea, malabsorption, fever and weight loss. Malignant disease, such as Kaposi's sarcoma, neurological disorders, 
एच आई वी एनरेफलोपथी माएलोपैथी एंड पेरिफेरल न्योरोपैथी एंड मायोपैथी लाइपोडिस्ट्रॉफी और लिम्फेडनोपैथी में बी सीन मैनी अदर ऑर्गन्स कैन बी अफेक्टेड सच एज द गैस्ट्रोइंटेस्टिनल ट्रैक्ट लिवर किडनी एंड पैंक्रियस माइकोबैक्टीरियम एवियन कॉम्प्लेक्स कैन बी सीन इन द लिम्फ नोड्स लिवर बोन मैरो ब्लड एंड यूरिन ऑफ पेशेंट्स मोस्ट केसेस आर अफेक्टेड बाय ट्यूबरक्यूलोसिस ऑफ द लंग्स एक्यूट रिनल फेलियर इज सीन इन मेनी सब्जेक्ट्स क्रोनिक डायरिया में परसिस्ट इन द एब्सेंस ऑफ आइडेंटिफाइबल एंटेरिक पैथोजेंस एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ एआईडीएस एंटेरोफैथी मैलन्यूट्रिशन इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट कॉम्प्लिकेशन ऑफ एड्स प्रोटीन एनर्जी मैलन्यूट्रिशन इज सीन एज वेट लॉस बॉडी सेल मास डिप्लीशन डिक्रीज्ड स्किन फोल्ड थिकनेस decreased midarm circumference decreased iron binding capacity and hypoglycemia aids wasting syndrome is commonly reported so you could see for yourself the myriads of complications and disease conditions which an aids patient suffers from we would like you to understand a little more about some of the symptoms complications that have been mentioned above kaposi's sarcoma This is a malignant disease of the peripheral blood mononuclear cells which manifests itself as purple nodules on the skin, mucous membranes, lymph nodes and throughout the gastrointestinal tract. These purple nodules in the oral cavity or esophagus lead to pain and difficulty in chewing or swallowing. If in the intestinal tract, they can cause diarrhea and even intestinal obstruction. lymphomas including non hodgkins lymphoma can involve the small intestines and cause malabsorption diarrhea and intestinal obstruction if the lymphoma is in the brain it can cause alterations in personality psychosis depression and withdrawal and motor and cognitive abilities carcinomas of color and tongue are also seen neurologic diseases if the hiv enters the brain it may result in aids dementia myelopathy disease of the spinal cord can result in paralysis of the lower extremities myelopathy affects the motor and sensory functions leading to spasticity weakness in legs peripheral neuropathy is characterized by sensory loss pain weakness and wasting of muscles in the hands legs and feet the first signs are tingling burning numbness in toes and fingers aids wasting disease it is a diagnose for aids in the hiv positive individuals for whom no other cause of the symptoms can be identified it is characterized by persistent fever chronic fatigue malaise and diarrhea of unknown etiology weight loss of 10% to 15% is common lipodystrophy This is a disturbance of fat metabolism that involves the loss of the thin layer of fat making veins visible and protruding. Wasting of the face and limbs and accumulation of fat in the abdomen and between the shoulders is an important feature lymphadenopathy syndrome the lymph nodes are swollen firm and sometimes tender causing a range of infections such as HIV influenza or even lymphoma cancer of lymph nodes dot today several retroviral drugs are available to destroy hiv or suppress its replication management after a viral load test which measures the quantity of free virus circulating in the blood stream as cd4 and t cells can make the treatment comprehensive and focused on likelihood of developing aids cd4 cells also known as t cells are essential components of the defense mechanism against infectious diseases table 3.1 gives some idea of the cd4 cell count the conditions common problems and symptoms associated with it result of cd4 tests are used to plan appropriate treatment measures and medical intervention table 3.1 condition associated with cd4 cell count in hiv infection look at the screen now that we are clear about hiv aids and the complications linked with it let us move further and learn about the etiology 
prevalence, diagnosis and medical nutrition. Therapy for this chronic infection, A. Prevalence, etiology and pathophysiology, more than 33 million people throughout the world suffer from HIV as estimated by WHO, World Health Organization, 2017. Currently, the infected umbrella spreads in a descending order to Sub-Saharan Africa, South Latin America, Caribbean, North America, Middle East, Western Europe, Eastern Central Asia, China, Japan, etc. The overall incidence in the country has been increased up to 0.22%. Delhi AIDS Control Society, 2017. Dot, primary infection with HIV is the underlying cause of AIDS. This invades the genetic code of CD4 cells or T helper lymphocyte cells. Infection occurs from an infected person through body fluids such as blood, semen, vaginal secretions and lymph system and the central nervous system. The virus, HIV, causes progressive depletion of CD4 cells. This leads to immune deficiency and other complications finally leading to AIDS. Even breast milk, saliva, tears and urine contain enough virus to infect human beings. Unprotected sex, sharing of contaminated needles, across the placenta to the baby are common ways of getting in touch with infected body fluids. Workers must take precautions for themselves or others when working with body fluids. The virus is not transmitted by causal contact, touching, hugging, kissing or sharing utensils, glasses, etc. It is uncertain whether all HIV-infected persons develop AIDS. Reports indicate about 5% of HIV-infected individuals exhibit no signs of progression to AIDS. B. Diagnosis of HIV infection The first step is ELISA, enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, screening. The second step involves Western blot testing for confirmation of suspected positive samples. Both the tests are highly sensitive and specific. This is associated with the clinical symptoms that may vary with the stages of disease. C. HIV medical management. The goals of medical management of HIV are to prolong life and improve the quality of life, suppress the virus to as low a level as possible, optimize and extend the usefulness of currently available therapies and minimize drug toxicity and manage side effects. Disease progression differs from an individual to individual. Therefore, treatment decisions must be individualized, keeping in mind the stages. AIDS is the final stage of HIV. It often causes severe protein energy malnutrition and IS often known as AIDS, wasting syndrome, D, malnutrition and AIDS. Malnutrition is an important and complicated consequence of HIV infection. It normally manifests as 1. Protein energy malnutrition associated with weight loss, body cell mass, depletion, decreased skin fold thickness and mid-arm circumference, decreased iron binding capacity and hypolbuminemia 2. AIDS wasting syndrome associated with the involuntary weight loss of 10%. Baseline body weight plus either chronic diarrhea to lose stools day for more than 20 days or chronic weakness and documented fever for 30 days or more intermittent or constant in the absence of an associated illness or condition that would explain the findings. It may be associated with the following a. Inadequate food intake associated with disorders of mouth and oesophagus such as candidiasis, herpes simplex, severe anorexia, secondary to medication, depression, infections. In addition, other contributory factors would be nausea, vomiting, dyspnea, fatigue or neurologic disease b. Malabsorption of nutrients. The malabsorptive symptoms have been related to both drug-diet interactions and the progressive effects of HIV. Infection An AIDS enteropathy in the early stages of infection is 
characterize it by blunting of the intestinal villi, abnormal intestinal enzymes that cause clinical malabsorption. HIV infection infiltrates lymphocytes as well as enterocytes which make the gut more prone to infections leading to severe diarrhea and malabsorption. C. Disordered metabolism relates to hypermetabolism or altered energy metabolism usually associated with end-stage effects of the HIV infections as well as increased spread of several infections. There is a progressive depletion of lean body mass as well as increase in RE, resting energy, expenditure. Energy metabolism is altered as cycling of fatty acids is associated with increased serum triglycerides levels the catabolism of skeletal muscle as an endogenous sources of energy and elevated levels of the cytokine alpha interferon produced by the cells of the immune system. The metabolic picture is unlike simple starvation in which body fat is oxidized. For energy, studies indicate that as the wasting of lean body mass nears 55% normal for age, sex, and height in persons with AIDS death is imminent regardless of the cause of malnutrition. Body fat is not a predictable marker of wasting in individuals with AIDS, especially men tend to lose body cell mass with little loss of fat in contrast to uncomplicated starvation in which fat stores are depleted. Malnutrition may contribute to the frequency and severity of infection seen in AIDS by compromising immune function. Deficiencies of protein, calories, copper, zinc, selenium, iron, essential fatty acids, pyridoxine, folate, vitamin A, vitamin C and vitamin all interfere with immune function. Severe weight loss can also result in organ damage which may increase the risk for a fatal outcome from infections. Now let us understand the medical nutrition therapy for AIDS. E. Medical nutrition therapy The general goals of nutrition intervention are to preserve optimal protein status, prevent nutrient deficiencies or excesses known to compromise immune function, Minimize nutrition-related complications that interfere with either intake or absorption of nutrients. Support optimal therapeutic drug levels. Enhance the quality of life. And educate patients on importance of balanced diet or how to improve nutritional status. Table 3.2 Presence The screening criteria for medical nutrition therapy in HIV-infected adults and adolescents older than 18 years of age Table 3.2 Screening for medical nutrition therapy in HIV-infected adults and adolescents older than 18 years of age Referral is automatic when any one of the following conditions exist 1. Newly diagnosed HIV infection or never been seen by a registered dietitian 2. If asymptomatic, not seen by a registered dietitian in the past 6 months to 1 year 3. Newly diagnosed HIV with symptoms or AIDS 4. If HIV with symptoms or AIDS not seen by a dietitian in the past 6 months or more, 5. Greater than 5% unintentional weight loss from usual body weight within the last 6 months or since the last visit, percent weight loss formula, usual body weight current, body weight 106. Poor oral intake of food or fluid, 7. Change in stools, color, consistency, frequency. Smell 8. Persistent gas, bloating, heartburn 9. Persistent diarrhea or constipation 10. Persistent nausea or vomiting 11. Difficulty chewing, swallowing. Mouth sores, thrush or herpes simplex type 1, 12. Severe dental caries 13. Changes in perception of taste of smell 14. Food allergies, food intolerance, fat, lactose, wheat, etc. 15. Economically unable to meet caloric and nutrient needs. 16. Concomitant diabetes mellitus, hypertension, hepatic or renal insufficiency. 
हार्ट डिजीज कैंसर प्रेगनेंसी और अदर न्यूट्रिशन रिलेटेड कंडीशन 17। विजिबल वेस्टिंग 450 हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी मिलीग्राम्स पर डेसिलीटर ट्वेंटी वन स्केड्यूल्ड कीमोथेरेपी और रेडिएशन थेरेपी ट्वेंटी टू मेडिकेशन रेजिमेन दैट इन्वॉल्व फूड और मील मॉडिफिकेशन ट्वेंटी थ्री नीड फॉर इंटरल और पेरेंटरल न्यूट्रिशन ट्वेंटी फोर पेशेंट और एम डी इनिशिएटेड वेट मैनेजमेंट ओबेसिटी वाइटामिन मिनरल सप्लीमेंटेशन वेजिटेरियनिज्म और कॉम्प्लीमेंट्री अल्टरनेटिव डाइट थेरेपीज वंस द पेशेंट्स हैव बीन स्क्रीन्ड फॉर मेडिकल न्यूट्रिशन थेरेपी द डाइटरी गाइडलाइंस इंक्लूड एनर्जी एनर्जी नीड्स वेरी डिपेंडिंग ऑन द हेल्थ स्टेटस ऑफ द इंडिविजुअल एट द टाइम ऑफ एच आई वी इन्फेक्शन द प्रोग्रेशन ऑफ द डिजीज एंड द डिवेलपमेंट ऑफ कॉम्प्लिकेशंस दैट इम्पेयर न्यूट्रिएंट इनटेक एंड यूटिलाइजेशन एक्टिविटी कैन ऑल्सो इफेक्ट एनर्जी रिक्वायरमेंट्स डिपेंडिंग ऑन द एक्टिविटी द एनर्जी इज इंक्रीज्ड इन केस ऑफ फीवर द एनर्जी इनटेक शुड बी फर्दर इंक्रीज्ड सो दैट देयर इज नो लॉस ऑफ वेट प्रोटीन High protein diets might safely promote positive nitrogen balance and lean body mass repletion. Studies are still needed to clarify the ability of high protein diets to reverse HIV associated malnutrition and body composition changes. Considering that the requirements of protein are increased, an intake of 1.0 to 1.4 gkg for maintenance and 1.5 to 2.0 gkg for repletion has been recommended protein restriction is recommended only in persons with severe hepatic or renal diseases fats a moderate fat intake is recommended for an hiv patient to add on to the caloric density and palatability of the food given tolerance to fat varies from person to person Studies suggest that the use of medium chain triglyceride MCT oil is better than long chain triglycerides based supplements for decreasing stool fat and stool nitrogen content and in reducing the number of bowel movements and abdominal symptoms MCTs are more readily absorbed than long chain triglycerides fish oil omega 3 fatty acids when given with mct oil may improve immune function because this combination is less inflammation promoting than the usual omega 6 fatty acids fluids and electrolytes fluids needs in hiv infected individuals are similar to those of well individuals and are calculated to be 30 to 35 ml kg 8 to 12 cups for adults with additional amounts to compensate for losses from diarrhea nausea and vomiting night sweats and prolonged fever replacement of electrolyte loss na k and chloride in the presence of vomiting and diarrhea is also recommended vitamin and minerals the exact requirements for vitamins and minerals are still unknown increased intake of the following micronutrients carotene vitamin e ascorbic acid Vitamin B12, vitamin B6 and folic acid is recommended. Use of vitamin mineral supplement providing 100% RDA is also recommended. Water safety, HIV AIDS subjects are vulnerable because of the immune suppression. Hence water borne pathogens are a concern. Water safety is important. Boil water, filter tap water Use boiled water as far as possible. HIV and AIDS infected patients are known to have symptoms associated with medications, malnutrition, malabsorption. Some of the practical eating suggestions for symptom management are given in Table 3.3. Table 3.3 Practical eating suggestions for symptom management, symptom problem management, nausea, small, frequent meals. avoidance of high fat greasy foods cool or room temperature foods avoidance of lying down flat after eating sore mouth throat soft moist foods avoidance of spicy or acidic foods experimentation with temperature of foods avoidance of very hot or very cold foods cool or room temperature foods are best use of nutrient and 
Energidens foods to maximize oral intake, xerostomia, dry mouth, use of foods that are moist or served with a sauce or gravy. Consumption of liquids at mealtimes and extra fluids between meals. Emphasis on good oral hygiene, flossing, brushing and rinsing, regular dental care. Use of fluoride gels or mouthwashes. Consideration of prophylactic antifungal therapy. Chewing of sugarless, gum or sucking of mints, difficulty with breathing. Use of easy-to-eat foods. Use of nutrient and energy dense foods, diarrhea fluid and electrolyte replacement, low insoluble, high soluble fiber diet. Possible benefits from low lactose diet, low fat diet may be indicated. Avoidance of gas causing foods, beverages and caffeine, constipation increased fluid and dietary fiber intake. Use of nutrient and energy dense foods including nutritional supplements. Use of small, frequent meals and snacks, consideration of alternative nutrition support, fatigue, adequate sleep, relaxation, exercise, adequate diet, especially foods rich in vitamins B12, A, C, folate and carotene or zinc, as inadequate levels may cause fatigue, avoidance of caffeine, alcohol, cigarette smoking and Recreational drug use. Avoidance of stress and treatment of anxiety or depression, identification and management of possible causes for anemia, medications, AZT, Bactrim, interferon, perimethamine, other causes, alcohol abuse, bleeding, mycobacterium avium complex, tuberculosis, fungal infections, cytomegalovirus, body cell mass loss, adequate diet. Parotitis respiratory tract infection etc. be moderately symptomatic, anemia, neutropenia, cardiomyopathy, diarrhea, herpes, stomatitis, nephropathy, fever one month etc. see severely symptomatic, opportunistic infections, severe, failure to thrive, wasting syndrome, HIV encephalopathy, malignancy etc. you will find it difficult to understand some of the technical terms. Read the glossary. In this unit which defines these terms, nutritional problems among infants and children infected with HIV are related to dash, poor growth weight gain, dash, impaired immune function and recurrent infections, dash, depressed gastrointestinal tract function, malabsorption of fat, protein and carbohydrates even without diarrhea, dot, dash, malnutrition with multiple nutritional deficiencies, dash, dysregulation of lipid metabolism and the fat redistribution syndrome, dash, poor appetite, limited food preferences and taking a long time to eat, nutrition assessment is very important before developing a diet plan for HIV-infected children. Since developmental delays may occur, therefore the infant child's Developmental age rather than the actual age should be used to assist the most appropriate textures, feeding position and utensils. As a dietitian, you must make an attempt to identify the type timing of meals which can be managed by the child, caregiver, in particular the time, duration, the child takes to eat a particular meal. The nutrient requirement for pediatric patients can be much higher than for adults, the major changes in macro and micronutrients being, dash, the requirements for energy increase by 100% in view of their mobility, fever, and catch-up growth. The height for age data may be used as a guidance to Estimate energy requirements among children with impaired growth, dash, the protein requirements increase by 150% to 200% above the recommended dietary allowance to counteract nutritional demands imposed by HIV infection and also to promote adequate growth development of the infant child, dash. The vitamin and mineral requirements are not known for pediatric patients, however, it is recommended to increase the intake by 100% through the incorporation of natural foods as micronutrients supplements are generally not recommended. Other special considerations 
alternative modes of feeding such as gastrostomy may be required. The patient's diet may be supplemented or substituted with semi-elemental or elemental formulas or age-appropriate sip feed supplements may be given. Pediatric patients may have a poor appetite wherein the child should be served small frequent meals with palatable snacks in between. Prevent children from consuming too much of water beverages before meals. At times, HIV-infected children may take a long time to eat meals. In such situations, limit meal timings to not more than 30 minutes. Encourage praise on completion and offer extra food if desired in case of infants care must be taken while introducing new foods. Monitor the child closely for any signs of allergic reactions. Proper nutritional care of HIV-infected pediatric patients can help them in achieving timely milestones and delay the onset of AIDS and its complications. We end our discussions on HIV infection here. Every symptom and complication of AIDS requires careful dietary care. We have highlighted the key aspects in this section. However, it would be a good diocese in detail from other knowledge sources. 3.8 Summary In this unit, we studied about the defense mechanism of our body. The defense mechanism, as you would recall, comprises of the first line of defense which are generalized and specific ones, comprising of cell-mediated and humoral response. Then. We moved on to the infections and fevers. Here we learnt that infection and fevers are coexistent. Fevers, as you had seen, vary depending on the nature of an infection. An infection can be either acute or chronic. Acute infections, fevers include typhoid, malaria, etc., while chronic infections include tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS. We learnt the etiology medical and nutritional therapy for each of these. Finally, we focused on the metabolic abrasions, the associated symptoms, dietary modifications due to drug and nutrient interaction and a brief list of foods to be included and excluded among other considerations. Thank you. Subscribe to our channel for more updates and we will see you with the next chapter.